Today's podcast is brought to you by Patreon supporter John Schuster. If you'd like to learn how you can support the podcast through a small, recurring monthly donation, log on to schooloflast.com forward slash P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We're also sponsored this week by funnyandamen.com. Uh, Kevin Hackenberg up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is all about creating clean comedy content for his site, funnyandamen.com. And he's also all about helping comedians who need good quality video to get better bookings to make that happen. And that's exactly what he did for me recently. I was up in Philly doing a show. He came out, recorded all the comics on the show. I was able to provide me with clips that I can use to send out to booking agents, to put on my website, to share on social media. And it's really high quality 4K video, which if you don't know what that is, it's sharp. It's super clean. Uh, he'll set up a few cameras for you, give you some uh, flips between the close-up and the shortly wider range shot. And it just looks great. Uh, I can't say enough about Kevin Hackenberg and the team at funnyandamen.com. He's in Philly, but if you're thinking about doing this, uh, it's worth giving him a call, checking out his website, and contacting him. Uh, He may be able to come to where you are. Again, that's funnyandamen.com. And thanks, Kevin, for sponsoring the podcast. Welcome to the School of Laughs podcast, brought to you by schooloflaughs.com. Whether you're an aspiring comedian, a part-time pro, or a speaker who wants to become funnier, this is the podcast for you. We'll break down tools, tips, and techniques to help you get bigger, better, and more bookable. And now, here's the show. Welcome to the podcast. Rick Roberts here. Thanks again to our sponsors for making this podcast happen and keeping us out there relevant and posting twice a month i hope that's enough for you guys it's as much as i can handle right now with the travel schedule and uh, excited today for our podcast with lee harden lee is a nashville guy he uh, first took my classes about three years ago took a few of them did the graduation show and he is one of the guys that kept with it stuck with it uh had the hard gigs, tough gigs, the open mics, the no response types of gigs like we all have when we first start. But he's got traction now. Uh, last two times I've seen him out at different uh, venues. He's been solid, steady, and getting bigger laughs every single time. His point of view is starting to come into focus, and it's it's really cool to see. So I thought it'd be a good listen for you guys to kind of see where he's at three years in, what experiences he's having what he's doing to get gigs, to uh, make connections with booking agents, with comedians, and to find ways to be proactive to actually get out there and do this, not just sitting back waiting. Uh, We talk about different steps he's taken, about his website, how that helps out, how uh, just connections between comics can help sometimes make a connection with the comic, and how he goes about you know, touching base with colleges, churches, and clubs, all out of his own hustle. So I'm, I'm inspired to to share this with you guys. It was fun catching up with Lee, and now we're going to listen to the episode together, and I'll talk to you a little bit afterwards. Here's Lee Harden. Lee, how's it going, buddy? It's going great. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for stopping by the official headquarters of the School of Laughs. I love it. It's very organized. This is good. You like my stained glass window over there? (laughs) It's very holy. It's it's the only one in the building. Keeps me clean. (laughs) Keeps me clean. It's good. No, thanks for asking me to be on this. I love it. Yeah, well, you you know, I've known you, I'm trying to think, is it three years? I started going to open mics about three years ago, so. Yeah. uh, And I took the class before i went to open mic so yeah that's when i first bumped into mm-hmm. you and at that point you were still working at vanderbilt i was working with uh, vanderbilt athletics doing sports video shooting uh coaching film highlight film and luckily i had luckily the schedule worked out where i could take a writing class and learn how to write jokes and yeah and weren't you making a few funny videos and stuff a little bit back in the day or no some yeah like when i like when i was a video production major we would do some um silly sketches but uh but even with Vandy, there'd be some times when we had free time, I would just take audio clips from what coaches would say and uh, put them on top of uh, videos I'd find on YouTube and play them for the coaches. They they thought it'd be funny. and That's cool. Yeah, that was, that was fun. So I would get bored easily. Yeah. You know? no. So I'd use, I'd, I would utilize my boredom. You got to amuse yourself. You do. If you can't do, if you can't do that, then you, there's no chance of being a comedian. Exactly. <laughs> right? exactly. You can't make your own stuff. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's cool. Then you took the classes and stuff, and then... Mm-hmm. Uh, you're one of the guys, you know, a lot of people take the class and some people are doing it just to kind of check it out. Mm-hmm. Some people are like, I kind of want to do comedy and this seems like a good way to speed it up a little bit. Where were you at in that? Oh, exactly. I just, 
I was always obsessed with any kind of stand-up comedy, just as a little kid. Even before Comedy Central, like, specials were happening, I was, you know, having specials memorized, like, by Dana Carvey. And even, like, on Saturday Night Live, after Saturday Night Live, they would have these showcases on NBC from just different spots, and Louis Anderson would always host it. Yeah, I remember those. Yeah, and I just became a big fan of Louis back then. He even had a cartoon that was really fun. Yeah. So I just was, anytime stand-up was on, I was always watching and just obsessed with it. Yeah. And around that time, I just thought about how, how do you get into it? I didn't know how. I thought you just had to be funny right away. And the more comedy I was listening to, like on Pandora and stuff, I was like, there's probably a reason they're saying certain words at certain times. There's probably a, I feel like there's probably an art form to what they're doing. And right. I look into the, the joke writing class. And so I was like, okay, before I try this, I want to learn how to write a joke. I, I think there's a science behind it. And sure enough, you take the class, you find out there's a lot more to it than you realize. It's not just being naturally funny. That does help. It helps but a lot. But yeah. If, if learning the structure of what makes something funny. Yeah, there's a lot. It's, it's amazing how much is behind it that you don't see. <laughs> yeah. And then... I don't know if you're like me. When I was in college, I took a film class, and I could never really watch films again because I was looking at the establishing shot. Did you yep. feel that way after doing the comedy classes? Like You wrote the jokes, then you started doing open mics, listening to your audio. You definitely don't listen to your old albums the same way, your favorite stuff. Mm -hmm. You still find it funny, but you kinda, yeah, you kind of see the pup, you know. The strings on the puppets a little bit. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. You know, it's like still good, but yeah, you don't. Fully enjoy. Don't it. fully enjoy so it the same I, I way. I apologize for it. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I'm sure those guys that you loved have gone through the same stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt. That's cool. So, man, three years has gone by pretty fast. It has. Uh, but what I like about what you've done, and like I say, some people take the classes to check it out. Some people kind of like want to put the pedal to the metal. Mm -hmm. And even of those people, you know, a certain amount of them tap out after three or four open mics. So they just like it's rough. Oh, it's not for me. Mm -hmm. But you've you've gone past that point of frustration. You figured sure. out how to make it work a little. Yeah, yeah. I mean, There's, we've, we've yeah. done spots at the same places mm -hmm. uh, fairly often. Every quarter or so, it seems like we're at some spot working an open mic or yeah. doing something. And uh, you, you keep writing, and you, you're getting better every single time. You're more comfortable on stage. Appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, it's cool to see. So that's one reason I want to get you on the podcast, just to kind of catch up to where you're at now mm -hmm. because we only do see each other every once in a while every once, yeah every couple of months or something yeah but there's good progress growing on so tell me yeah. about the and which side note if i can interrupt that Please. that didn't mean a lot to me i was about a year maybe a year and six months in and you had seen me before because i'd had done your graduation show and we were doing a show at the pavilion one night mm -hmm. and i was kind of in a phase where i was like trying to transition into like being more conversational or like should i quit because this what I had in mind is not what I'm doing. It's not working out well. And I was at the show just kind of trying to, yeah, trying to be more conversational, seeing how it went. And after the show, you came up and you like you hadn't done this before. You were like, okay, I see a difference. I see improvement. Mm -hmm. I see a, I see a big improvement from when you started. So that that um, that was enough to make me go, okay, I feel like I'm in the right direction. Oh, good, so good. The, the fact that you took time to come say something and you, it's something stood out. That was that was very encouraging. Well, it was. It was a good set. Yeah. I mean, I remember the last two or three times I've seen you over there. Uh, not only are you doing different material and working that out, but it's it's pretty tight. But you also have a nice flow to where you allow the audience to digest it at their own pace mm -hmm. before jumping into the next thing. Even sure. though uh, there's there's zero downtime from the point where they they're finished with that joke and ready for the next. Like you, you've, your timing is really really well. well I appreciate well paced that. Out. Now, do you feel like? Is that the case? Do you feel like that's the case most often now or more often than not? Or you still feel 50-50? What do you feel on that? It all depends on how, how much they laugh. Like, uh, like I was in Chicago Tuesday at a showcase at Zany's. And spots where I'm used to hearing laughter on jokes, some of them didn't get that. So I had to, I had to stand up straight for a second and you know, froze. I was, I, it reminded me of when I first started trying to do jokes at open mics, okay. where I thought jokes would get laughs. They didn't. I'd, my face would react. I'd right. get a face twitch. Yeah. And so I just I did that, and I was like, "All right, it'll be okay. Maybe the next one will will get them." Yeah. So it really just depends on that crowd reaction. Right. So no, like, kind of filling out when the laughter's dying, and sometimes depends on the show. Sometimes I'll just talk to it. 
I don't mean to do crowd work, but sometimes I'll just find a guy if he's not, if he's just kind of smiling, I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I'll point him out. I'll like, I'll find something. I don't know what, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a bad default I've been getting into. I'm trying to, yeah, I mean, it's, at least you identified a, a, a bad thing and you know, you're aware of it because it is very uh, inviting to go to the crowd when with your normal jokes aren't working, mm-hmm. but, um, but you're not going to get back on track unless you stay with your set and find your way through it, right? Yeah, exactly. And then the other thing, too, I mean, you're traveling around a little bit mm-hmm. you're regionally. We're here in Nashville, Tennessee, which is a good spot. Mm-hmm. You can get to a lot of places in eight hours if you hunker down and the mm-hmm. traffic's slowing. Uh, I remember when I first started, first few gigs I did, even outside of Columbus, I would go as far as Dayton, and some of my jokes wouldn't work at all. Sure. Have you found, like, you've got some Tennessee jokes, and then you've got your jokes Maybe. that work everywhere, and then you've got some that... You know, just depends. Maybe, yeah. Uh, go back to Tuesday, and uh, one of my comedy friends down there, Michelle uh, Kerjacki, she uh, she came to the show. Gave, I got her a comp ticket, and I've all I have like five, maybe five to six minutes on on Goodwill. Mm-hmm. Read a lot about Goodwill, and apparently in that area, um, Old Town is where that Zanies is. I found this out after because I was like, man, there have been some giggles on these jokes, but they're not really flying. And she was kind of saying, well, Old Town has a lot of more higher up people. They may they may know about Goodwill, but they've right. probably never stepped inside one. So they may not know exactly what you're talking about. Right. So, and these were, this is like the Goodwill stuff was the first time I was like, hey, I can write a lot about one topic. So trying to go, okay, do I do I change that or do I educate them more about it? Do I find a new five minutes? I wasn't I wasn't super bombed. It just set me back a little. I'm going. How do I, how do I fix this? Yeah. I, I my, you know, I want to make everywhere I go. I want to, I want everybody to laugh. I want everybody to enjoy themselves and have a good time. And part of that is making your jokes, you know, yeah, accessible related. to everyone. Yeah. Not too many specific references. Which I had a bad habit of writing those when I, on my comedy homework. I remember just movie references that. Yeah, I remember, I remember that. Right, you're yeah. like <laughs> mentioning something in the third scene of the second episode exactly. of the trilogy of a, yeah. of a movie nobody saw in the first. Right, I'm like, uh, you know, I get what you're saying, but it's like uh, a Facebook group might I like this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got that. I got rid of that. I'm like, I wanna, I want these jokes to be from me, but I want them to be broad as well. Like, right, well, that's smart, and it may be something as just stepping back and just saying thrift store instead of goodwill. Yeah, and, and then they, they everybody's. Been, you know, maybe they're uppity, but they're pretending they just don't. Remember. Sure, they're, they don't want to laugh. But there are definitely some regional things. I remember when I first moved to Nashville, I had a, a whole bit, and one of the punchlines was uh, about Dunkin' Donuts, and I did it in dead silence. And, but there was no Dunkin' Donuts here yet. Right, it hadn't got out and you know expanded as much. So the guy said, "Hey, why don't you change it to Krispy Kreme?" And the joke worked twice as hard. There you, you go, know, twice as good the next day. So that was small. Small words, small yeah. references, absolutely. So it's a matter of yeah, just making it more accessible. And sometimes you don't know until you do it. Now you know when you go back to Chicago, especially maybe that area. Mm-hmm. Or you look at the crowd. I mean, I don't know what the crowd was there Tuesday, but if they're not in college or in between mm-hmm. high school and college, or well, I guess they'd be 18 and up, whatever. Sure. But those are typically the goodwill years, even though I've, sure. I've been known to still frequently. Yeah, same here. Yeah, <laughs> <You> know, that's why. <laughs> find some cool sweatshirts and stuff. But, exactly. But that's that's the target for that joke, mm-hmm. primarily. So exactly. what was the, the demographic on Tuesday? Was it more established or early Maybe more established, older. I mean, could have been their 40s in yeah. that crowd, maybe. So some college, but I feel like mostly after college. Yeah. yeah. Which is, it's, it's okay. I mean, like... The key thing is that joke is about you, so it's always going to be about you. Sure. And so it's just maybe looking out and seeing how many people might dial into it. But that is a big chunk of material. Like once you got into it, yeah, you're like I, oh here's three more minutes and sure. I'm plow through. And yep, enough of it, enough of it worked because you could have mentioned any store on some of the jokes. Mm-hmm. Just the one I was so used. To, I talk about how just the smell, and I think everyone knows exactly what that right. Like a hardware store, people know what exactly that smell. You mentioned that about goodwill everyone kind of already knows tuesday i mentioned it it was kind of flat like, yeah all right well <laughs> <laughs> do they know about big lots and all the other ones May, uh, i don't know I, I tried those and they i heard some chuckles but it wasn't it wasn't a collective laugh like i was used to yeah. used to getting you know it that is interesting because i mean nashville is a very suburb type town right because it's a it's a very college town not mm-hmm. that chicago isn't but chicago has these dense population areas where the there's just not enough room for a big lots to go in and make sure. a profit. Exactly. Or a Kmart's not there anymore. So, 
Um, yeah, you're not going to. Yeah, you won't see those downtown. Yeah, I've had to change Cracker Barrel sometimes. Like when I go mm-hmm. to Canada, sure, I have to find a way to rework that joke. What's and, their version of, of Cracker Barrel? Well, I've got the thing about the Cracker Barrel tornado. Oh yeah, yeah. and so instead of me it. being at a Cracker Barrel, I put myself at a Hard Rock Cafe. Okay. And so instead of uh, anvils and antlers flying off the wall, it's amps and lamps and John Cougar melon amps. <laughs> <laughs> instead of slipping on cherry cobbler, it's the Ted Nugent tater tots. I love it. But That's... I literally just kind of wrote line for line. I, you know, and I went and had lunch at the Hard Rock and just looked around, just like I did when I first wrote sure. the Cracker Barrel joke. Yeah, used all the it out. Used the rhyming, alliteration, and all that stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. all the same techniques, just swapped it out. And that was kind of a good exercise mm-hmm. uh, the first time I did it, but... So cool, man. So so Tuesday with Chicago. Tell me about some of the other gigs you've done, uh, good, bad, or ugly, because I know they're probably all <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> they're all yeah. in there, right? Kind of all over. It's uh, it's kind of cool how it developed, too. Because uh, you're doing the open mics. You're not really getting a lot of shows quite yet. But you've done, you know, because I remember I, do, I did your uh, one of your graduation shows, mm-hmm. and I, I had a video of the five minutes. I'm like... I thought it was decent enough to where if I could talk to other comics, like, hey, could I just get five minutes on one of your shows? Most of, most of them will say, yeah, because they don't have anything to lose. Mm-hmm. Like Dan Whitehurst, he was one of the first guys. He had a show at this uh, bowling alley in Clarksville. Oh, yeah, I remember that. The Pinnacle. Yeah, I never got to go out there. But it's, well, I heard it's, it's tough right. to get people out, though, huh? Yeah, there were more people waiting for it to end so they could do their karaoke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were lined up. They were just, like, back of the wall because he had to pay to watch the show. And they right. were just angry, waiting for karaoke to it end. It wasn't exactly cheap, if I remember, like, a 15 or 20 bucks or something. Expensive ticket for not... And then not, look in and see four people. Kind yeah. Of like, you had a lot of... Yeah, they didn't have the best start there. Not the best start. The, the heart was in the right place. It was well organized. It was just you know combination, yeah. maybe the location, and I don't know. It's a uh, Clarksville's always been a hard town for comedy because mm-hmm. it's such a you know it's a military town. Yep. So you have a lot of military out of town. Exactly. You have a lot of single moms at home that can't get out, and a lot of people just would rather do karaoke in yeah. Clarksville. But it started there, and I just decided, well, maybe my stuff. Maybe I can get in other places. Another great place to get into is uh, South Street Comedy Club. That's where I'm going to be this weekend. But the guy owner there, actually, you connected me with him, Harvey Boyd. Harvey Boyd. He's great. He loves young comics. He, if you ask, hey, can I come? Like two weeks in advance, if you ask, if you can come. He's usually cool about it. He'll give you like, he'll give you 20 minutes if you want it because he's like, you drove up here that you drove from Nashville. Take as much time as you needed to work on jokes. That's good. Yeah, I remember when I first moved to Tennessee, people were like, "Yeah, go down to Jackson." Yeah, it's a great club. Out of it's split between a restaurant. You pull up, you think you're just going to be doing comedy at a restaurant, and you walk and in. And it's kind of a decent size. It's room. It's a decent club. Like the stage is, it's a cool stage. It really is. And the only thing I remember that sometimes is weird is they have people seated upstairs behind you almost. Yeah, it's yeah behind right. you a little. And uh, lately, there's been like some like. Because they, they rent the space out to bands sometimes. Uh-huh. So some of the shows have had like the Stuff gear, on gear still on stage. Um, so trying to get around there as well. Just another thing I tried to do was get on colleges. I tried to, e- I think I emailed every college in the surrounding states, their student activities board. It's, this is a lot of trial and error. Most mm-hmm. of them don't get back to you. Same with churches. If you're just cold emailing them, it's almost easier to find if there's a show available. Asking if you can get on it. Right. On top of that, you just email clubs. And before I did all this, too, I uh, decided to build myself a website like on Squarespace. It was pretty easy to do. I just I feel like if you if you email a club or email anybody, hey, I would love to do a show for you or I'd love to do some time. If you have a website at the bottom of your signature and they look at the website, it looks like you take yourself seriously. Right. So it, it's worth the investment. It's not a bad investment. It's about... I don't know if it's 200 or under 200 to build or own your own domain on Squarespace. It's, I, I feel like it's helped because you put video clips of yourself on there, show listings. And at first, I just I just kind of went back a few months just to make it look like I had a lot of shows. Sure, yeah. Like, yeah, oh, he's working. A little bit like, yeah. yeah, he's working. Good. No, that's good. And, you know, one question, and I ask myself this sometimes, I'll pull up my website and go, would I book me yeah. right now looking at what I, When's right. the last time I posted an update? Exactly. Like, oh, I've spent a month because I've been busy. Sure. So, I've, like, when I'm the busiest, I haven't been updating as, as much. Right. So, what I've started to do is go in and I'm on WordPress, my site. Mm-hmm. So, I'll schedule, I'll, I'll plug in pictures and a quote from the person who booked me. And, yeah. And then I'll just schedule one to show up every Monday. Mm-hmm. So, 
you know, once a month I sit down and put four of those in. It takes me about 45 minutes. Right, and staying active. I, yeah. yeah. Then when I'm on the road, I don't have to worry about logging in and uploading all that stuff. Exactly. It's so, a Monday kind of thing. That's the thing I need to add. I need to do more, like, news updates on it. I have show listings. That's the most updating things mm-hmm. I do to it. But What about other social media? Is that a, one of those little widgets on your – Yep. With Squarespace, I added a Lee Harden comedy on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And the way I do the shows is through uh, Bands in Town. That's who Squarespace, they use that for their shows because a lot of bands will use it. So you just set it up with Bands in Town. You add the show on that Facebook page, and it'll automatically link up oh, to your Squarespace you. page. So your comedy show, you're listing where the bands list their stuff. Yep, I'm listing and it on automatically my, forwards it yep, to your... My Bands in Town page, add it on there. It goes straight. It adds right like to the that. website. I have to, I'll have to look at that. I haven't done that or checked that out before. Yeah, but it's not bad. Yeah, for a lot of people listening, Squarespace is an easy way to get in. It's very good. They'd be a good sponsor. Sponsor, Rick. They, they want to call sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, guys. But I know a, a basic website is a big struggle for a lot of companies. It is. And I'm not – like I tried doing web design and graphics. I was terrible at it. Like in college, I was I was the worst. But you found Squarespace to be I pretty I found easy. Squarespace and I just thought – I need something clean. You don't need to be flashy. Just something that looks like you take yourself seriously. You don't need a lot of graphics. You don't need to look silly. I think that's a big thing. I think it's a big mistake, too. It's a good pointing that out. Yeah. Because for a while I had a – and I still love the profile pic. Um, Nora Canfield, she takes these really cool pictures. I think almost every comedian – yeah. Media National does them. Yeah, let me just plug her real quick in case you want to check her out. So it's Nora Canfield, and I think it's M S D I G Photography, Miss mm-hmm. Dig, and she does what she calls lollipop pictures. And they're where great. She, she highlights the area behind mm-hmm. you, which makes it look like you're glowing, and then she'll she'll do her little Photoshop magic, but she'll accentuate some of your features to make mm-hmm. them stand out. And then a lot of times she'll have a comic bring a prop in or something yep. to add a little flavor to it. So tell us about your picture with her. Uh, I had a couple. But the one I chose, like, because I, I was starting to get, I got, like, one show, like, the, this comes to comedy. I, I did this small contest back in my hometown, won it. They wanted you to have your own show. I didn't know how to do any of that. And I'm like, well, I guess I need a photo for a flyer. And I went up to her and took, a, you know, had random props. But the one I probably, the one I used has a, has a red coffee mug that I bought that day before the shoot. Mm-hmm. And this book, which is actually a really good uh, book, it's called How to Be Funny. I think one of Jay Leno's writers oh, yeah, is the I've author. Oh, yeah, I've seen somewhere before, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a pretty cool book. It's not designed for stand-up, but it's still a, it gets a, it's a good resource to have because it gives you very similar to yours. It gives some joke exercises. Right. It's pretty cool. And I had that book, so it's a photo of me. It looks like I'm getting caught reading, like how to, like I'm cheating. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so my eyes are wide open, and you can see clearly the title of the book right there, How to Be Funny. And people, yeah, you got a good response on Facebook. And so it was a fun pick. Yeah, she does so, a great job. And I, she does. I'll link to that information in the yeah. show notes. I've got her card here in the office. Yeah, she's great. Sure I, put I, it in. I think every comedian needs to get something from her. She's yeah, yeah really she's good at what she two does. Two of my CD covers and yep. all of my promo since I've Yep, Dusty Slay has a, his first album. That's her photo, too. Yeah, mm-hmm. making that chocolate. Or yeah, uh, chocolate. making that fudge. Making that fudge. fudge. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Dusty, now you make chocolate, too. They make chocolate. So cool. Um, so you've got the you got the the website in place. Yep. You got the work work ethic where you're you know hustling and, and emailing, yeah, emailing clubs, emailing and churches, emailing colleges, yeah, church, yeah, not waiting for things to happen. You're out there making them trying. Because I would spend if I had a day off work, I would spend the whole day. I'm just going to email everybody on this list, and I've gotten more no's than yeses. And sometimes I've had to talk myself up. I. Uh, like I did one, it's like a booked open mic in Louisville. It's now called Car- Comedy Caravan. It used to be called Laughing Derby. Right. And the guy that runs that told me who to contact if I wanted to get on shows. And I had to, it was a few back and forth emails because he was like, I, I don't know who you are. So I went back to listen everywhere I've been, mm-hmm. even though they may have just been guest spots or five minutes. I just, sure. here's where I've worked. And a couple back and forth. He's like, okay, if you want to do five minutes, Sure, that's fine. Cool. So I got to go up do like five minutes for Bob Zaney. He's, he's one of my favorites. He's hilarious. He actually has a lot of Goodwill stuff. To, well, his jokes are more about he has props that he things that he bought at Goodwill. Yeah, and he puts them up on stage, just riffs because he's really good at riffing just off the cuff like right. that. Then you get to work with Chainsaw oh. or Hack, Hackman. What, what, what was, that's not Chainsaw, I can tell already. Uh, Hacksaw. Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Yeah. Hacksaw. I wish I would have introduced him as that. 
Like, <laughs> and tell, tell, tell people don't know who that is. Who oh, is. Hacksaw Jim Duggan is a pro wrestler, mostly known from the golden era of the 80s. I'm going to get really nerdy here for a second. Go ahead. I just I grew up a big wrestling fan, and the WWE Network's not helping because it's you can just watch all your old favorites. Right. But he, yeah, he was a, he's now a Hall of Famer in the WWE, but called WWF back then. He he's known for carrying this like two by four or this giant two by four to the ring with him and he does this like oh he does that <laughs> sticks his thumb out all the time i feel like you knew who he was you just wanted me to get the thumb i just got the name wrong okay because i was a <laughs> big yeah. hulk hogan and yeah. jimmy superfly snooker exactly and, and he was around when they were around but he he does tours like around comedy clubs he doesn't do stand-up which is really it's like q a or q a does storytelling it's cool to see that him just because mm-hmm. people want to come hear all these stories they haven't heard before and along with the q a and he's got a cool merch table his wife sells the merch and i kind of uh fanboyed out i bought i bought one of the shirts and wore it on stage just because i was like why not i'm sure he'll sure they'll like that that's cool man yeah, that was fun yeah jamie let me uh jamie ellie he was the owner of the club me and some other guys he knew were wrestling fans come up do the show and it, it that was a good payoff because jamie saw me and this is a compliment to you as well once he saw me do that five minutes the first time for bob zaney he was like okay do you know rick roberts because he, he could tell that i was a rick roberts guy oh he was like your jokes are well crafted hey, <laughs> good transitions they're they're well put together. Cool. Man. I can tell that you, you know, you hung out with Rick Roberts, Sweet, man. And yeah, that so that your name your name does well. It's it's gotten me in other places too. There's a guy named oh, Tom, Tom Sobel. Yeah, does a lot of booking in Kentucky. Tom kind of gives the same compliments to Jamie did. He's like, okay, I can you were with Rick. That makes sense. So kept my name and started getting me gigs out of town, which is fun. Cool, man. Yeah. So you, again, I think the attitude of like going up there not expecting anything like not expecting to get paid at this level right just going for the experience i'm too new to go i can't go unless i get paid they don't because they don't know who i am right so and that's worth spending a second on because i know a lot of you know the the two well there's a lot of things that bookers tell me but then one the first thing is that the entitlement no yeah feel that they get from all these brand new comics you may have done a thousand open mics but the first time in the club it's an audition, really, yeah. regardless of how you think it is. or sure. you know, And really, you're just doing some time, and you, you're best just not to screw it up. Exactly. Or so the not, fact that you went up there and you're like, hey, I'm just, I'm just here. You know, can I do five minutes? And then mm-hmm. he ends up paying you to host it, which got, got you probably to do a little bit longer set, I would imagine. Yeah, got about 15 minutes. And then yeah. there was even a section on that show where Tom was like, because there, there was a girl doing a guest spot. She won a contest, and Tom was like, I don't know, it was it was kind of going too long, and he kind of leaned over to me. He's like, "Hey, can you do a few more minutes of jokes to get him back up again?" And yeah, yeah. So that was cool that he that was cool that he saw enough to trust you. And yeah, no, that's good. And yeah. he's got a lot of stuff close, which is yeah, good. a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff in Kentucky. He plans a lot of events, and that's where I've gotten. I got really busy in October because of him. It was maybe a month after I got to work with him. Then he's like calling me at the last minute like hey you it's it was like a f- friday he calls like that morning i leave like a work meeting it's like hey can you be in elizabeth town by seven i'm like i'll try yeah yeah luckily it worked out so That's cool, small man. stuff like that it's it's cool to see like people react because that was the big that was a big concern because you're thinking can my stuff will can it work elsewhere right. am i just crazy should i stop this all together just rewrite or just quit i don't know what to do yeah, it is. I mean, it's really untested ground when you first start. Like, I'm thinking just back to my early days. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you would be, the happiest moment was getting the gig, and then sometimes the second happiest moment was, oh, I got, I'm done. Yeah. Like, that did <laughs> not over. go well. I got, but it's all those cumulative experiences. Mm-hmm. But it is when you're out there on your own, man, yeah. it's like, it's a lot of mental toughness. Uh, there's times where uh, you just have to smile and go, keep going. Like, I did a gig maybe six weeks ago, it was a Chamber of Commerce banquet. Which is typically great because they're all leading professionals in, sure. in the area or whatever, and you know it's a nice nice dinner. But the uh, catering operation was the, all there was between us and them was a curtain. Like they were in the showroom, mm-hmm. eighteen feet away from me on my right, and they're clearing plates and dropping knives and forks. <laughs> even though that was in the pre discussion, like they right. can't do that, and like. Which they they dropped some glass and broke it, and I'm just up there, and it was obviously a distraction to everybody else in the audience. Right. Um, but 
I kind of made a few faces like I'm okay, you know. Yeah. Just they they stayed with me because they knew I knew. Right? And did when, you did you try to riff off that when the like? I feel like that's a tip. That's a good stand up practice thing. You hear glass drop. Yeah, you know, you got those one liners in your pocket. But if if they were visible, I would have done some riffing. Sure. But because I thought enough of the audience was far enough away that it wasn't bothering them, I didn't want to draw more attention to it. Okay. So but when they broke the glass, I, I think I did say something. Everyone, it's just like when I'm on stage, I'm like, the first lines that come to you are all those lines you've heard over the years. Yeah. I'm, like, well, I'm not going to say who who dropped their contact lens, or right. that sounds like a job opening, or <laughs> is Ernest T. Bass back in town, or right. you know, there's like, <laughs> so I'm like, ah, by the time I try to figure out my original take on it, I'm done. But right, but it was one of those deals where was, the the show was going fine, but I I, I knew it would have been like a killer show if they would have just shut up. Yeah. But if I say shut up, then all of a sudden the crowd doesn't like me anymore. Yeah. Well, yeah. let me ask you just on your on your short term. The outlook, what you're looking to do here this in 2017. Sure. You got some, some goals you've written down or kind of gone over in your mind that you yeah, want to stick with? Absolutely. Just trying to hopefully stay busier. February, the February got busy and it kind of came out of nowhere. Everyone I was trying to contact for shows brought up February, which is cool. Hopefully the rest of the months get busy. I'm also trying to, I mean, it's, it's outside of comedy, but I'm trying to get rid of any kind of debt, like student loan debt. Right. Hard debt because I don't want to have anything holding you back. Holding me back, yeah. exactly. I don't want that. No, that's smart. You know, the it's not easy to get rid of it. But right, I mean, just let me be clear. You you still got a full time job that you're working, or is it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's part time, but it can it can get it's almost flexible. up to full time. It's very yeah. flexible. Yeah, I work at Apple now, and the good part about that, it's always flexible enough to work around. I've I haven't had to turn down a gig yet. I've always been that's able good. to get it covered. It's cool, man. I'm, I'll definitely have you back on a little further down the road sure. and see what's going on. But I thought this is a, a good – you know, I haven't had too many people on in this three-year range. Yeah. And I know a lot of people listening are in the same kind of boat. Exactly. They've still got the full-time job or the part-time, and they're making that yep. you know, just, slow transition over. So And so much of it is, like, just mental. It is, man. It's all yeah. mindset, and it's yeah. all thick skin, and it's all mm-hmm. ex- ex- expecting a no. And then when you get the yes, it's nothing but a huge – relief it's great yeah <laughs> i love yeah i'm excited that the progress that's happened it's it's been really cool i'm trying to I'm trying to be humble and trying to stay level-headed about all of it and being being just grateful for anyone saying yes to anywhere so that's cool man well thanks good. for popping in here today lee thanks for having lee, you me tell them your website so they can put a face with the voice absolutely it's uh, lee harden and the last name is h-a-r-d-i-n very good and if you like that squarespace thing squarespace uh, hey guys boom do it <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks bud there you go hope you enjoyed that episode with lee harden Three years in, making things happen, and sharing how he's making things happen with you guys so you can make them happen too. That's what it's all about here on the School of Last podcast. I really do mean it when I say I try to help you guys get bigger, better, and more bookable. And I also take notes from students, from people I interview, and try to get better and bigger and more bookable myself. Hope it's working out on your end. It's working out on my end, and I enjoy doing this podcast. A uh, quick note about Patreon. It's been a couple of weeks since I've talked about it, but if you hear that and you're not sure what it is, basically it's a way for you to support the podcast with a small monthly recurring donation. It can be as little as a buck, but uh, starting at 7 bucks a month, you actually get some nice perks, which include the uh, Google Hangouts, or now I guess we're doing them on Zoom. But once a month, we get together. All the Patreon people who want to jump on the phone call over the Internet, Uh, we see each other. We talk about what's working, what's not, uh, different experiences we're having. And at that $7 a month level, you're also in Club 52, which is a 52-week email program where you receive an email from me every single weekend with one bite-sized, actionable tip you can take to make yourself bigger, better, more bookable. Sometimes we talk about booking processes, uh, different scripts you can use kind of when you talk to people on the phone best way to follow up after a gig, best way to get a recommendation. Other times we talk about travel, some ways to save money on the road, uh, just a whole gamut of information, you know, a lot of business stuff of comedy in those Club 52 emails. And you can find out more about that, schooloflast.com forward slash P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And if that's something you want to join into, uh, I suggest doing it. It helps the podcast out, but above and beyond, I think you can get a lot of value if you jump into the Club 52 and the Google Hangout level, $7 a month or more. It's been a lot of fun, and we'll have another one of those Hangouts coming up really soon. 
So that's it for now. Thanks again for listening. Stay safe out there and stay funny. Thanks for listening to the School of Laughs podcast. If you'd like to hear more School of Laughs podcasts, you can find them on iTunes and Stitcher.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. For information on upcoming live and online classes, visit schooloflaps.com. Until next time, stay tuned, stay focused, and stay money.